in the real estate. And uh, I'm going to let uh, introduce. Um, I'm going to have a moderating this panel with Michael Bull. Michael Bull has got. A, he's going to introduce himself and tell us uh, what he does about his shows. He's got a lot of followers. Uh, Michael. Good morning. I'm Michael Bull. Uh, I'm uh, CEO of Bull Realty, a regional commercial real estate firm based here in Atlanta. We're licensed in nine states, and we do all types of investment properties. I'm also host of the uh, Commercial Real Estate Show. It's a national talk radio show about commercial real estate related topics. And, um, and, and with that, if, if each of you would mind doing the same thing, tell us your name, title, and a brief description of, of your firm so we know who's, who we're, who's speaking. Jonathan? Didn't know we're coming from this end. Yeah, uh, go my name's Jonathan Wilson. I'm an attorney here in Atlanta with the law firm of Taylor English Duma. My partner, Stephen Wright, is here today as well. Uh, we are 130 lawyers, and our office is just about a mile up the road. Uh, I do a lot of work with startups, but I'm a, a general corporate and securities lawyer uh, and have done a lot of work with crowdfunding as well. I uh, wrote some articles and some mini books for a couple of the crowdfunding platforms. Uh, talking about the Invest George exemption that we have here in our state and uh, some of the other developments. And uh, my firm uh, helped to fund, uh, uh, helped to close the, the first successful uh, IG offering here in the state, which was a company called Bohemian Guitar that raised a little more than $120,000. So uh, we like to use crowdfunding with, uh, with a lot of our clients and we look forward to seeing it as a, uh, a growth opportunity for the future. Julian? I'm Julian Hellman, the CEO of Realty Mobile. I'm Brian Daly, uh, co-founder and CEO of Ground Floor. I'm Carlo Tabibi, the co-founder and CEO of Patch of Land, a real estate platform that focuses more on debt than equity. All right. Okay. Uh, I think one thing that's interesting about crowdfunding and commercial real estate is the timing of the cycle. I mean, we're in a recovery part of the cycle. Uh, there's not been new mu much new construction. So all the analysts believe that commercial real estate is going to do well in, in the next several years. And I'd like to see if, if someone on the panel or a few people would like to comment on, on really the timing of crowdfunding commercial real estate and, and the growth that you expect. So I've been involved in real estate pretty much my whole life. Um, I've been constructing houses and building office buildings and managing uh, different types of uh, real estate throughout the USA and I've basically watched the up cycle and the down cycle of the real estate market for the last uh, I guess two cycles and it's been uh, an interesting time the last few years in fact in 2006 I sold all of my real estate assets and um, just before the market collapsed so it was great timing for myself and um, where, where it's going to go today it's, it's an up cycle but uh, the, the rate of the economy is growing is fantastic uh, interest rates are low who knows what will happen in the next few years when interest rates go up and uh, that will obviously have an effect on the pricing of real estate because cap rates will probably go up in, in, in tandem with uh, rate increases at the Fed. So um, it, it, the next few years are going to be interesting to watch and uh, I think the fact that the crowdfunding in industry of real estate is happening now is a great place to be because as the real estate cycle is on an upswing, we're in a safe place to uh, participate. Uh, obviously, as things turn uh, for, for the worse at some point, and they will do, um, we all have to make sure that we position our, our companies and the deals that we have on our site uh, to work as well in a down cycle. So we've got to have equity uh, and uh, debt that will be secure and safe. And that's where I think it's going. Yeah, I think that you know we've got great timing today, but we are a little more pessimistic about you know the future and and how we're making investments today, or, or rather the types of investments that we're providing on the platform for investors. Um, we think that there will be another recession, and, and we spent a lot of time talking about this at investment committee and, and determining you know what is our criteria for a real estate company to post their transaction on, on our platform and. What's that led, what that has led to is us offering up opportunities in what we think are counter-cyclical investment opportunities or you know, in opportunities that are gonna bode better in a recession. So an example of that is self-storage. Um, we're really bullish on self-storage. We closed on a 2,400 unit self-storage transaction in North Carolina actually. And that's typically a, a counter-cyclical type of investment. Another big investment that we've made is into mobile home parks. So great cash flowing assets, great real estate, um, well, not so great real estate, actually. They're, they're typically not, you know, class A, beautiful mobile home parks. They're, they're mobile home parks. But at the same time, 
they're counter cyclical and you've got millions and millions and millions of people who can't afford a single family home um, they can't even afford an apartment and so we're, we're pretty bullish in the mobile home park space uh, another place that we're investing because of this thesis that we think that you know there's a potential for another recession is in sort of durable goods in retail um, and also service retail. So when you think about the impact of the internet and, and Amazon, you know, where you can order anything essentially, you can order toilet paper off of Amazon if you want to. Um, we're, we're looking at you know, what type of retail is gonna stay around and, and we're looking at medical, we're looking at veterinarian clinics, um, karate studios, stuff like that, which you've got service oriented retail that tends to, to fare decently well. Um, but this idea of where are we in the real estate cycle is something we, we spend a lot of time talking about at our firm. We're very concerned about multifamily right now, and it'd be interesting actually to hear your, your opinion on multifamily specifically, Michael, but we see, we, we've seen about two to three billion dollars in deal flow in the last 12 months. Um, we see a great deal of, of deal flow, and we're seeing a lot of people overpay for multifamily, and, and we don't allow it on the platform. Not that you know, we're geniuses, but we just, there, there's minimum criteria to get on our platform. Um, so we're really concerned about multifamily. That doesn't mean that we're not investing in multifamily, we are. Um, but it just means that we're careful about, you know, what opportunities we're, we're showing in, in the multifamily sector. And, and I like multifamily. I think uh, the demographics are there with millennials. And, of course, every deal comes down to the actual property, the actual project itself. Mm -hmm. And it also comes down to the sponsor. So if you will, some, uh, on the panel here, speak to how you handle finding these projects and the sponsors, how you vet the sponsors that are doing these transactions that these investors are investing with. Right. Uh, yeah. So we've um, we've been. You know, Jillian talked about the difference between innovating and inventing. Uh, you know, we feel like uh, we've been inventing a little bit. We're really one of the only platforms that has uh, been foolish or smart enough to offer micro lending as an option to non-accredited investors. And we've been doing that here in Georgia uh, for the last few months. We piloted that concept, and you know, like like any um, new technology. I mean, my my previous startup before this was <coughs> was not, and I'm I'm unique up here in that I'm not a real estate person. Uh, I'm a technology entrepreneur, and the previous company I started was Republic Wireless, it was a hybrid uh, cell phone carrier that also did something that sounded kind of foolish that nobody would buy. Uh, when you're innovating, you need early adopters uh, early in the cycle. I love how Jillian described that uh, during her talk at the beginning because you need people who are true believers. And so at this stage with non-accredited investors, the non-accredited investor business is you know, at least a year or two behind the accredited investor platform. We have so much education to do uh, on both sides, on the deal flow side as well as the, um, as well as on the investor side. And you know, we're as far, out, uh, as far out ahead of that as anyone. So we have, um, we have a multi-factor test that, we are, uh, that we're applying to our deals that we're gonna expose to investors. We believe that investors are smart enough, that the web is smart enough to self-underwrite. That's a radical idea. That's one that's born out of the true spirit and essence of crowd sourcing, and we're testing it. So uh, we're gonna take a little bit of a radical and different approach because we do view ourselves as inventors, and I think at this stage, you know, to, to say that we have a standardized way of vetting a sponsor and vetting a project, I think would be, um, it's far too early to standardize uh, in micro lending for, um, for assets that are participated in by non-accredited investors. So I think it's gonna be interesting to see how that plays out. It was certainly interesting in the case of Lending Club and Prosper, how that played out. They went through many cycles uh, as they evolved uh, as platforms, and we will too. Uh, it's early days, it's an enormous market, uh, and there's a lot of learning to do. Uh, and that's yeah, where we are. I want to follow up question and, and that yeah. uh, from you, Brian, because we just had a, 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 some announcements, some news in just recently in the USA Today. And I know you're, you did that. You came from Harvard, actually, and then you did some background. And a lot of it come from technology side. So, but you're kind of waited behind the scene. I know that Julian's and other fellow and other platform, they went out there and they did deal. You just kind of came over here in Georgia and did some test market. and. Now I think, do you see this the time, because I see you're active right now, your company it is, by the way, you're sponsoring this panel, so you're out there, and uh, so what, what do you see? Do you see the momentum change? Well, I don't know if it's a momentum change. I mean, as an entrepreneur, um, I think we would all say we see momentum changes, uh, acceleration, <laughs> accelerations and slowdowns, and there are ups and downs throughout the startup cycle. So 
I don't get too caught up uh, in any one of them. We have been working for over a year to get to this moment, and this is the moment when we have uh, filed what is the most broad-based uh, offering of crowdfunded, truly crowdfunded securities to non-accredited investors in the United States. Uh, we started down that cycle. It covers 43 million investors who would be eligible to invest in the assets all over the country. Uh, and so that was our big announcement this week. And so, yeah, there's a rush of momentum around that. We're excited about it. But, you know, I'm sure, like any inventor, right, we're going to hit walls, uh, you know, that feel impossible. We have to break through and we'll slow down. So count on that, right? Uh, we're figuring it out and I think we're making great progress. We've funded four deals here in Georgia uh, at a low scale. Um, the numbers are not big, uh, but the learning is. The learning is enormous. Uh, and as an entrepreneur, I know that in any new market, whenever you're creating something new, what matters is the speed that you learn uh, and the speed of iteration. So that's really what we're going for. Um, the path doesn't have to be straightened up to the right for us in order to feel like we're making progress. Jonathan, do you have a comment on vetting sponsors? Well, sure. I just responded to your question about vetting sponsors and projects in, in the crowdfunding arena. I, I think what's especially interesting about crowdfunding is the way that it breaks the paradigm of how information is supposed to flow between issuers of securities and investors. In you know, traditional securities regulation, information is tightly restricted and filtered and controlled. If you're writing a registration statement for a company that's going public, you know precisely what, hap what kind of information has to be disclosed about your officers and directors because there's an SEC regulation that says you have to disclose A, B, C, D, E, F, G. And you disclose A, B, C, D, E, F, G and nothing more. And investors don't get any additional information. When the company goes public, there's no chat room where the investors are talking to each other and exchanging information. So that, that story doesn't get out there unless it's strictly prescribed by the regulations. Crowdfunding turns that on its head. In crowdfunding, Investors are going to be talking to each other in chat rooms on the platform all the time. And if the promoter has, you know, a domestic abuse issue from six years ago, that's going to be, that's going to come out. So if you're vetting promoters and deals in a, uh, in a crowdfunding offering, you want to have a really well scrubbed, uh, well healed promoter and a well healed uh, project because any adverse information is going to come out. That's the power of the crowd. If I can just add this, uh, to, to what's being said at the table. Um, we're living in the information age. The reason why crowdfunding today works is because you're able to mass distribute the information on someone's portal to the general population. So if you're living in this age of, of the information age, then you want to share that information with as many people as you can on your website so they've got the information to make the best possible investment on your website. Gillian, I, I want to ask you this question because you, you're all about uh, educating the investors, the new investors. What do, you, what do you guys do basically with this? Do you do, you do any kind of uh, educating the investors, the investors? Do you have these chat rooms that investors talk about? What do you do then? Yeah, so we, we spend a lot of time and energy on, on educating investors and, and also on vetting sponsors. But for us, education is all about content. Um, it's about distributing great content and providing that freely available. You know, you've got a, a ton of folks who make a lot of money in the internet marketing business and they're selling content. Um, and I, I, it, I'm still shocking to me that people pay for that content because it's all freely available on the internet, including on our website. Um, it, but, but it's really interesting. You know, we're, we're big believers that education is free. So not only do we have loads and loads of content, but I personally you know, made it my mission this year to educate over 100,000 people on crowdfunding. I think I've, I'm getting close already and it's, it's <laughs> only <laughs> April given how much I travel and, and how much I, I just get in front of people to really talk about crowdfunding. Um, another thing that we do is we host webinars. And what's really interesting about the webinars that we host for each of our transactions is you'll get some really sophisticated real estate investors coupled with individuals who are making their first real estate investment. And these sophisticated real estate investors are, are you know, educating these new real estate investors because they're asking different questions. They're asking very technical questions and we try and make it a point on a lot of our webinars to take a step back and explain, you know, we just did a webinar for the Hard Rock Hotel in Palm Springs and ADR kept getting thrown around. And you know, the third time it was thrown around, I said, you know, let's take a step back and can you describe what ADR is? It's, it's average daily rate for a hotel. Um, but your, your new investor isn't going to know that. Where your sophisticated investor, you know, they, they can speak and walk and talk the jargon. So we, we try and do our best to explain that stuff. Um, real quick, just on the note of sponsors, you know, we think about crowdfunding as, a, as democratization of access to deal flow. And for us, that means that we're working with a select group of sponsors. We typically look for real estate companies who have already done over $100 million in transactions. Um, so we are you know, not allowing the general population to use the platform. I think it's a very different model than, than what Brian's model is. And, and 
we'll see you know what works I think at the end of the day both will work um, I tend to believe that the crowd is also very very smart and, and that you get a ton of diligence out of the crowd but we do do our own layer of diligence before we send it out to the crowd speaking of that uh, your Michael uh, Michael Bold is very great brand here in Georgia and a lot of different places. You have a great radio show. How many audience? About 20,000 on your radio show? Yeah, just online there's about 20,000 a week, but uh, on the air, I don't know how many because we're on 11 stations. 11 stations? Um, how many states? Um, in uh, 10 states. So uh, um, speaking of a crowd, the real estate crowd, I mean, you do, you, you had some interview with uh, Julian, some of the experts. What, how do they feel? What did, what did they are? How, is it unknown territory for them? What did, what did, what is their reaction? You talk to them. You do those uh, telephone calls, and what do you? I mean, and what do they see that? Well, well, that's a good question because commercial real estate people are slow to change, if you will. Like residential, for example, went online a lot faster. Commercial real estate people tend to want to hide the information, uh, and there's a little pushback. So, you know, getting these sponsors to to use crowdfunding, and I'm curious from some of you guys, you know, what what are the advantages to a sponsor? to use crowdfunding to raise capital and, and how's it gone? How you know how you get these real high quality sponsors to, to come online with you? So do you see them there for this crowdfunding or unknown territory? What is what is how is the reaction? Are they well, for I, it? On well not I think it? It, I think it depends on on the uh, sponsor and how familiar they are with it, how comfortable they are with it, how comfortable they are with not knowing Jack. Yeah. Um, when you spoke out earlier, are you comfortable with having a lot of investors who, who you don't know who they are or you don't know their experience level? Um, so, so I think that's something that's changing and, and, and I think it's going to change uh, a lot. I think be, because, you know, when I interviewed Jillian, one of the things that she brought up on our show was that, you know, people are more comfortable investing in the stocks online you know, over the last several years than they were before. Uh, and I think it's going to become where they're more they're okay investing in real estate and and I'd like to ask some of the panel you know as far as that goes when, when you're when these investors are looking at these projects commercial real estate can be very due diligence driven there can be a lot of details down to reviewing each lease and, and some things in the lease that can really control the value of an asset uh, things going on in the sub market how much information is available and do these investors because a lot of them some of them are investing a l lower amount of money they just not want to know. Do they not want to talk to you? They don't want. Do they want less information? Uh, I guess I'll go first here because we all, the three of us sitting at this table, have different business models. Um, mine again is focused solely on debt. So you asked a couple of questions, which was how do the sponsors think of uh, putting their deals on the platform? So we're basically bringing lower price debt to the market than um, what people are able to get through regular lenders. Uh, we're also giving them easier access and quicker access because we're able to process quicker through some technology that we've implemented online. Um, so in terms of the sponsors coming to the platform, uh, every single sponsor I've spoken to that we've agreed to do a deal with has loved the platform so far. Uh, we again have a, have a long vetting process for the developer so we don't take any deal that comes to the platform. In terms of your question of what the investors are looking for, again, because this is debt rather than equity, um, we, gi we give a lot of information, but because it's a shorter term issue and the, and the, and, and the fact that it is a first lien position with a personal guarantee, um, they realize that they've got a little bit more security than they do if they in were investing in equity. Not that equity is a bad thing, it's a great thing to invest in. Each uh, equity and debt has their own uh, position in someone's portfolio. So when we give out the uh, information on the website, we like to make sure that the, the investor knows what they're getting, the rates that they're getting, and uh, how much risk is in that deal. Um, that's how. Yeah. Yeah. Carla, let me ask you a question, then just follow up question. How many months, how, many, how old is your company? We've been around for six months. Uh, how many deals you guys brought to the table? So far, we've done 10 deals. We just closed our 10th deal. We've raised $2.3 million. Okay. Thank you. So I think, you know, unsurprisingly, uh, when you hold out a shingle and say that you can provide capital, people are interested in that. Um, you know, that's not surprising to anyone. Uh, when you start talking about what's involved in raising the capital and uh, to participate in an with an immature technology to do so, some people fall away. Uh, some people are more private and conservative. Uh, some people are more practical than others. Others are dreamers. The people that have uh, gotten um, very motivated around ground floor 
are people who see the potential for cultivating a following, who, uh, who see a, a new access, a new source for capital that's not only different in terms of maybe its cost, and frankly, sometimes it costs more than their other options, but it delivers some uh, very important benefits to them in terms of speed, uh, in terms of what it's like to deal with us instead of dealing with the bank, and really in terms of its durability over time. Because if, you know, the internet is pretty good at reputation. So the people who we've been dealing with at this stage are really people who understand that. And so like any early adopter, right, they've got to go through the, the sausage making factory of being part of a new technology. Uh, but most of them, the ones who uh, stick with us and, and really have, um, have been great early customers for us are people who not only tolerate that but are excited about it. And I think it's gonna be like that. Hopefully, you know, the business will start to scale. It's already happening for us. Uh, so we're already seeing that we're moving past that stage, but so far that's what it's been. But I think with this, it's, it's only going to, uh, um, it's only gonna attract certain segments of people over time. It's like any, it's, it's, uh, it's a well-known and well-documented technology, technology absorption cycle uh, that we're going through in this business. Uh, and I, you know, I think, uh, I agree with Jillian that I think it's going to grow very quickly and that people are gonna adopt this very quickly. Right, uh, your company, Ground Floor, what is what is your business model on the crowdfunding real estate? Oh well, we're a I mean we're a lender. Uh, we facilitate uh, we're a marketplace that facilitates micro lending by non accredited investors to residential real estate. So we've done uh, new construction projects uh, that are townhome projects, and we've done uh, some home renovation projects here in Southwest Atlanta, uh, in ca the Capital View Mark uh, neighborhood. If you're familiar with that, and the uh, Adair Park neighborhood down near the Beltline in Southwest Atlanta. So we've um, you know, it's every time it's a short-term micro loan. It's uh, you know a six-month term or a 12-month term, uh, and it's a loan. You know when it's going to be paid back. You know how what the interest rate is up front, and there's a first lien position or a second lien position usually on those products. And we should say that for our audience at home that, that this is for interest state, just in the state of Georgia. Georgia yes, that's exam. where we've been piloting. So we've been not, piloting not anyone, Georgia. just you're doing this so thing in Georgia. You know, one reason that our numbers are, are um, you know, proudly not scaled yet uh, is we came to Georgia to do Georgia projects from Georgia investors. And that's why we're so excited about the news this week, because now we're expanding to nationwide. We can take projects anywhere in the country, uh, and we can take investments from 43 million investors across six states. Thank you. Jonathan, what do you think about all this? Because I know you write articles, and I'm, I'm an advocate about, uh, you, be, you know, we had some issues about interest rate and no one. What do you see these uh, crowdfunding works in the real estate? I know a uh, your couple of your articles I read, and you're kind of an advocate about this interest rate, and you know. Sure, so uh, for me, what's exciting is, is the economics and the sociology behind crowdfunding, that it, it really breaks up the information flow and turns up the paradigm of securities regulation that tries to constrict information. I'm not exactly sure which of the various legal methods of offering securities is gonna become predominant. You know, Ground Floor so far has used the Invest Georgia exemption. Uh, they they're, they're now have a, a qualified offering uh, that's gonna be in multiple states, which is a different uh, securities approach. Uh, Realty Mogul has been doing uh, Regulation D offerings where all the investors have to be accredited. Uh, we've got some news out of Washington this week that you know the SEC still, SEC still hasn't given us rules uh, for interstate uh, crowdfunding under the Jobs Act and one of the key sponsors, uh, Representative McHenry, is saying that we now need to amend the Jobs Act to fix the crowdfunding rules that haven't even been issued yet. Uh, so I think the future as far as the legal pathways to crowdfunding is still very confusing, but the great promise of crowdfunding is the way that it, whether you call it democratizing deal flow or bringing uh, high value product to the masses in a way that it hasn't reached before is very exciting. And I, I, as a lawyer, I like to be solving complicated problems that no one has ever solved before. That's, that's what gets me excited in the morning. And I, I, I'm sure there are gonna be lots of complicated problems to solve in crowdfunding. And uh, whichever pathway it takes, I think it's gonna be a lot of fun to get there. Speaking of a deal flow, I'm gonna change the subject and go back to what you mentioned about these mini warehouses, you know, and all this, you know, trailer homes, and I know some big players, you know, I mean, I, I, by the way, you guys are big players too, in crowd, as far as I know, in real estate crowdfunding, and one of the frontiers, and you know, and uh, rule breaker, ground breakers, and I have to commend you, you know, because I can see in the past two years I've been in the crowdfunding, you guys, your companies, Carlos, Julian, you know, Brian, you know, you guys are, you know, kind of a revolutionary, you come to this and you put your head, you know, right there, and I have to tell you. And 
But speaking of that, I see a lot of big players are coming to this market, you know, uh, like the Carl Ives or Carlton Groups, and, you know, and they're kind of focusing to those deals that is like trailers. They're looking for the millionaire next door uh, kind of a people, actually, to investors. What do you see about that? How do you see about the, this thing changing? You know, are they, these people, they don't want to just particularly put some money in some Manhattan high rise. You know, they're looking for those deals near their community. Uh, do you see it like that? What do you see? Yeah, I mean, there, there are some institutions coming to the space. I think that, you know, the challenge there is, is that they don't have a lot of focus and emphasis on technology. So I'll, I'll share a specific example without sharing who it is, but I think you'll be able to figure it out. I, I went to this website. I got, you know, multiple links from it when they launched recently, and they said, have you seen this? Have you seen this? So I go to the website, and they're collecting Social Security numbers. They're collecting account numbers. They're collecting routing numbers. Well, they, they are not on a secure server, and they are not PCI compliant. And we didn't launch before we were on a secure server in PCI compliant. We didn't even take passwords until we were. Um, and there are a lot of these companies that, you know, they think they're compliant. They, they, they buy out-of-the-box technology. Um, I'm a big believer that this is a financial services business. It's not a technology business. So I'm kind of, you know, contradicting myself on, on this point. But it still is a technology business, right? Technology is a core competency of all of our firms. It has to be. Um, the other big difference that I'm seeing with the institutional players is they're only raising capital for their own transactions. So they're calling it crowdfunding, but really it's just a, a website where they raise money for their own deals. So it's a little bit different than sort of an, an open marketplace or even a curated marketplace like we run. Um, but there's going to be a lot of interest in the space. And, and I, I talked about this as far as adoption. This is not going to take eight years. It's been, you know, we, we've been in business a year and already we've done tens of millions of dollars in transactions and hundreds of millions of dollars in property value. And that, that was unheard of in sort of online capital markets a couple of years ago. So I think we're going to continue to see big players in the space. Um, I think that we're going we're gonna to see players that we, we haven't even imagined today they're going to enter the space. Um, but that's the exciting part about it. And, and as Brian mentioned, it's an $11 trillion industry. There, there are going to be multiple winners in this space. There are going to be multiple companies to do business with, just like there are tons of online broker dealers, right? E-Trade, Scott Trade, Charles Schwab, all these broker dealers. And, and at the end of the day, clients are going to choose where they want to invest. Um, and for, the, for that reason, customer service is really, really important to our company, client service making sure that people can, can reach a human being. I mean, I, I told the story of Jack, but there are other people who want to talk to people. Um, it just depends on who the client is, and I think that's a big part of crowdfunding. Brian, who's your customers? Who's your investors? Well, it's, um, it runs the gamut. You see a lot of people who are sophisticated real estate investors have maybe participated in hard money loans before uh, and know what they're doing. And then at the other end of the spectrum, there are people who watch house, fi house flipping shows on HGTV. <laughs> um, you know, and they think, okay, here's a way that I can get involved in the market. Uh, we've seen a lot of people, if people, um, people who like Lending Club love ground floor, and they should, because it's pretty much the same thing, just with an asset backing the loan. Uh, instead of unsecured credit card debt, it's a secured loan you know, to a real estate developer. So we've, um, we've really seen a broad cross section, and that's kind of the point. There's a great diversity here on options, and, and you talked about, Jillian, there, there's going to be a lot more. Um, so, so what are some things that the investors, these online investors, should think about, and what are they thinking about when they're looking at all the different platforms, and then within those platforms, the different investments that are out there, be it debt, equity, different property types? Uh, what are some tips you would give to those investors? Yeah, so a big one is, is transparency and accessibility. Um, we, we were early on the scene, so we have a lot of investors, but a lot of those investors then subsequently went on to other platforms and, and invested with other platforms. And, and we get no less than an email a week that says, we wish we had just stayed with you guys and, and only done business with you. It's just, it's not fun working with other platforms. Um, not, not all other platforms, right, but, but certain other platforms. And, and, and a big piece of that is because we're all startups ourselves. Um, but one thing that I tell a lot of investors is, look, we're startups ourselves, which means that not only are you taking risk in the real estate, but you're taking some counterparty risk in the crowdfunding company. These crowdfunding companies go out of business, that's going to be very, very scary. And they will, right? They, they will. And as the CEO of this firm, it's how do I stay in business? So not even how do I grow, just how do I stay in business to service the you know, 60 crowdfunding transactions that we've already done? And, and for us, that meant go raise big amounts of venture capital money. Um, it's why we've capitalized the company with $10 million in operating cash today. It's not that we needed $10 million in operating capital. But it's that I, coming out of a fiduciary background, you know, didn't want to be in a position where we didn't have enough cash to keep the company going. Um, so I think that is, is the crowdfunding platform well capitalized is a really, really big question that investors should be asking themselves. I also think that the, another question is, is the crowdfunding company regulated? Um, are they a broker dealer? Do they have people with securities licenses? You know, I, I've got to believe 
we might be the only crowdfunding company in the country where our CTO, our chief technology officer, has a Series 7 and a Series 63. And people ask me, he's not selling securities, why, why would you, you know, make him go through the pain and suffering? And it is pain and suffering, I, I did it myself. And we're building regulatory compliant software. So I think that you want to you want to invest with a crowdfunding company that's well capitalized, that is well regulated, and also that you know has has pillars of trust and transparency, and you can access people at the company. You know, if you're calling into a crowdfunding company, and you don't get an answer. That's not a company you want to invest in, in, in my opinion. Yeah, I should say, I was there last year in April of 2013 that you won the $500,000 seed investment in for your company, and so we come a long way. It's just yeah. recently closed nine million dollars. So this is a fast evolving business, you know, so and you guys are raising, and call them. Let us be the first to say thank you, Jillian. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's good for me to say, yeah, I did. I was actually there you, at you've that You've got a lot of other VCs who want yeah. it now, so but yeah. it's, it's been yeah, validated. Exactly. We're but all getting chased now, you. thanks. Yeah, no, that, but yeah, you're dead, you. but <laughs> now that's good. So then just, that's, that's a lot of hard work when you were one of the frontiers and along with Brian and Carlo. Carlo, your business model, you know, you come from a real estate family. You've been doing a lot of investment in on this. What is, what is it? You, you do, uh, you're a different model. You put some investment. Do you, are you sharing the wealth? So actually, I invest in the deals that come onto the platform. So when developers come to me and say, I need to borrow money, we actually underwrite that deal and lend the money before we even put it on the platform. So that's through a pre-funding facility that we have internally to the company. That obviously allows us to pick the best deals, to pick the best developers. And on top of that, we get to give the best rates back out to our investors because we negotiate the best possible deal at the point in time when the deal is made from the beginning. Um, it's a great facility, people are loving us. We're actually in talks with a few different banks to give us a multi-million dollar line of uh, pre-lending dollars. A lot of uh, investors who invest in group investing in real estate in particular uh, through ticks and through, through other ways have had issues that sometimes with the exit strategy with selling the, the property. What do you tell uh, investors uh, related to when they want out, when they want to sell, uh, about exit strategy? Anyone else? No, I mean, again, again bec because mine's focused on debt, so these are relatively short term. I mean, the ones that we've done so far have been uh, 30 day to uh, one year notes. Um, so people are just getting paid back. We've already paid back three deals um, out of the 10 that we've done. Uh, so, right now there's no secondary market per se of selling and th there's some rules around that as well, but in the future there'll probably be a, a secondary market out there so that people can transfer their rights and ownership, whether it's in equity or debt, and that'll be a great day for the entire industry because as the opportunity becomes to liquidate one's, one's investment at the point in time when they may need it, will allow more dollars to come into the industry. Yeah, our message is this is an illiquid investment. There is risk. You should be prepared to hold for the long term. This is not dinner table money. And, and I think anybody sharing a message that is different than that, run. Um, I, in fact, believe that there will eventually be a secondary market. I would never tell an investor that because that indicates to an investor that there may be a secondary market when who knows, right? And, and that, that opens up risk not only to the platform, it opens up risk to the investor. And you know, I, I would never want to put an investor in a position where they think that they're going to get money out when they're not. Um, like Carlo, we've had about 17 of our transactions have gone full cycle, but we have other transactions that we intend to be in for five to 10 years. Um, and, and it is a liquid, and part of the, the beauty of crowdfunding is that they can invest a smaller dollar amount in an illiquid transaction where maybe they didn't have the capacity to invest larger than that historically. Uh, who make the decision to sell all these things? The real yeah, estate they company. They yeah. do? Yep, the real estate company who we're partnering with will make the decision to sell. They, they've got you know a, a business plan and a business model, but. I'm a big believer in not trying to time the market. If we say you have to sell in year five and we're in a down cycle in year five, that's gonna be bad for everybody. So the real estate companies that we work with, we mandate today that they put capital behind the transaction. Um, so there's alignment of interest between the real estate company and the investor and that real estate company is making that determination of when is the proper time in the market cycle to sell. Yeah, so uh, we should say that they're all under the accredited investor 506C, for right? audience at home. So uh, could you elaborate on that? Sure, so a, an accredited investor is, is a high net worth investor. They typically have uh, either a net worth over a million dollars, excluding the value of their home, or an annual income over $200,000. A couple of other requirements, but those are the big ones. Thank you. Do you want to add to that? Jonathan? Jillian, of course, had the defini def definition exactly right. One of the key things, though, for the 506C offering is that the offer has to verify the accredited investor status, and that's something that often becomes a challenge uh, for some of the other platforms. For the Reg D offerings that we all grew up with, 
uh, you simply signed a piece of paper certifying that you were accredited, that you met the income or the net worth requirements, and that's good enough, and that, that was good enough and still is good enough under Rule 506B for the offerings that don't advertise the way, the way Jillian's do. Uh, for the 506C offerings, where there's advertising, uh, the issuer of the securities actually has to verify through one of several different means the accredited investor status uh, of the investor. And that, frankly, is still a bit of a challenge for the market, because one way of verifying status is have to have the investors send in their tax returns. Well, nobody wants to do that, and that's not convenient. Uh, the, the other alternative is to go to some sort of third-party accreditation service, and a lot of those folks are startups themselves, and their models are still developing, and I think that's one of the things that uh, the industry is going to have to perfect as, uh, as it becomes more mature. Speaking of that, the last uh, year in September when the Title II passed and, oh, and everybody well, had some phone calls actually, they said, are you guys going to put a big billboard advertisement around, do you see anybody in the industry? Is anybody doing that? Is anybody doing on that Title II? And, uh, just for the question for the whole panel. Julian, do you do any billboard advertising yeah, for 506C? Yeah, I mean, we, so we just launched Hard Rock Hotel Palm Springs, and actually that was our first 506C, and I think all of Carlo's offerings are yeah. 506C, so he can probably talk to this too, but... We, we went out with a huge media campaign. We had 110 million impressions on the Hard Rock Hotel Palm Springs that we can measure, and, and more than that probably that we can't measure. So that, that's crazy, right? That's a third of the U.S. population has, has seen some element of this, you know, according to the media and, and the way that, you know, press, press gives numbers. Um, so we, did, we didn't have a billboard, but, you know, I did Fox Business, where I, Fox Business Television where I was talking about the offering. Uh, we were in USA Today, we were in the Wall Street Journal, I mean, tons of publications that said, you can go to realtomogul.com backslash hard rock and make an investment in the transaction. Um, and that's a fundamental shift to the way that securities rules worked for the last 80 years. So it's been exciting. So there's a lot of things happening since the, the old 70 years rule, the final two, so we see tons. that a lot. Uh, speaking of that, I wanted to just one follow-up question. On that. You, a lot of people are getting this hotel, you know, crowdfunding. Is this because of they get perks? You know, they stay in a hotel for one week. Is like a timeshare? What's going on here? Yeah, it's interesting. Um, I think we've actually done the first. Well, no, no, no. Actually, there's there's another firm that done it that, that's done something similar. But this is the first for us where we've we've matched an investment opportunity, which is a real investment. The investors are getting cash flow off the hotel. They're getting appreciation off the hotel, but they get perks too. So they get um, eight discounted rooms, 25% off um, rooms, $50 food and beverage credit. They get free cabanas at the pool. You get a bottle of champagne when you show up at the hotel. You get a really cool owner's card. Um, so the first time that we've done it is an interesting test. It works really well for hospitality because you can drive revenues to hospitality by having people using the hotel. And, and what's interesting is Palm Springs is a major um, vacation destination from Los Angeles and, and Silicon Valley and some other places in California. And we now have all of these owners in the hotel who are literally going to go on vacation and say, I own this hotel. Um, and it's the first time that's been done, so it'll be exciting. But yeah, I think some people are because of the perks. They're, they're interesting. Am I going to be Airbnb of the crowdfunding to come up and stay, <laughs> <laughs> stay in some of your areas and say I can stay here? I don't know if any of you are going to vacation down in southwest Atlanta. Um, <laughs> but you're expanding. You're uh, not in Atlanta. You're uh, it's expanding here. Yeah. It's true, but we like that asset class. Um, and I think we, we will, um, you know, I like to say that um, you know, we're operating at the sort of base layer of the, of, of the real estate market, and we're comfortable there. We like that. We like the way to underwrite that asset class. Um, we also have been experimenting with advertising. That's one great thing about what Georgia has done with its legislation here. Uh, it has allowed us to learn what the cost of customer acquisition is. We know elementally uh, what it takes, uh, how much money it takes as an online marketer to acquire an account. Uh, we know how much uh, to expect from that account. Uh, at least in the early going, we have to interpolate a little bit to see beyond our couple of months of funding transactions exactly how that plays out. Um, but as an online marketer, and we are, we're, we're online marketers. It's one of the things we do as a company um, quite well. We are, um, I, I think that's a, this component of how you take something that, you know, 98% of Americans cannot do, which is participate in a private placement. Uh, the, legally, they're not allowed to do it in, in most cases. Uh, to help them understand <laughs> that they can't do it, uh, and then educate them about what it means to participate, uh, and, and then encourage them that you're not just selling them a bridge uh, on the internet, that there's actually, um, you know, there, there are actually protections in place. I, I agree wholeheartedly with what Jillian has said about um, being regulated companies and how good that is uh, to be legitimized. Um, but I think, you know, the ability to go out in the early stages of the market and to acquire um, people online through advertising here in Georgia has been great for us, right? It's, a, it's, it's one reason that I think, that I think of Georgia as a hotbed 
of uh, you know crowdfunding. Kind of, you do a lot of uh, 506C, and uh, so what do you see? What kind of deal? How is that be done? Could you yeah, it's great. I mean, we're using the internet, like I said, it's an information tool, so we're able to put out there that we're doing debt deals and debt offerings and um, doing some PPC campaigns and emailing different crowds, and it's, it's been a fantastic way to get our name out there as a brand, and uh, people are coming to the site and hearing about us and seeing about us and done some press releases, etc., about different deals that we've done. It's really been nice to be able to use this new uh, regulation and, and in a way it's its own technology, I guess, that's uh, allowed companies like ours, ours to form. It's a great space to be in. I love crowdfunding. I've done a deal already in the state of Georgia. We did a $103,000 loan to a lady who, um, who is in the real estate space, but we lent the money to her because she was buying the home and then leasing it to a veteran who had a VA certificate and he couldn't afford to buy the house just then because the house needed to be remodeled and someone needed to live in it. So we w we're helping the state of Georgia and other states too by having 506C rules in place and it's, it's a great thing to do. We, we like to call ourselves Rebuilding America. Well, again, so speaking of America, Michael, we have any questions? We're going to take about five minutes. We have two more minutes and we're going to take some questions from the audience. Actually. Okay. Um, Jonathan, I'd like to see if you could share some legal precautions for people involved in the crowdfunding space, Re real estate crowdfunding. <laughs> that's, that's a really big question. Um, it's one of those questions I like to tell uh, clients that uh, you know, every legal question you could possibly ask me uh, has one answer, and that is uh, yes with enough money and information. Uh, Legal precautions in the crowdfunding space, well, it's a complicated area. The very first thing you need to do is hire a lawyer who knows the, knows the space, who knows crowdfunding. Uh, the, the folks who have gone out there and have tried to do this on their own have just created a mess. And frankly, that, that doesn't do well for anyone who's trying to uh, you know, build a long-term value proposition in crowdfunding the way you know, everybody on this table is. Uh, so I, I don't know that there is one uh, piece of advice I can give other than get a lawyer who, who knows what they're doing uh, who can be flexible with you, uh, who can solve problems creatively, uh, while at the same time keeping you, you know, well uh, inside the lines as you, uh, as you get your deal done. I, mean, I, I come from regulated businesses too. Uh, telecom is a regulated business. Uh, I was in, in England, there was a, an act, the 2005 Gambling Act, that was meant to foster uh, the remote gaming industry, and I was part of a venture-backed startup there that was a regulated industry as well. And I think, um, you know, we thought of the regulatory landscape and the regulatory roadmap as one of the first problems that we needed to solve a year and a half ago when we started the company. And my co-founder, Nick Bargava, uh, was part of the group that uh, authored Title III of the Jobs Act, and he was an important contributor to that. Uh, he's uh, one of the leading thinkers about how to use existing regulation to, uh, you know, to open private placement investment uh, to more people, but to do it in a way that's safe and that's regulated. And, um, you know, I would say, you know, get you a co-founder who helped write Title III uh, if you're coming into the business. That's my advice to you. Uh, it's the smartest move I made. Have a good uh, very attorney. Early on. Uh, and we also hired a great attorney. I mean, we hired a, an excellent law firm that has been working with us on, uh, on this current offering that we're announcing this week. Um, but it's a lot of legal work. There's a lot of legal innovation here. Uh, there really is. And, um, you know, it's not just a technology play. It's, uh, it's not just a financial services play. It's also a regulated industry and it needs to be treated that way. That's, that's part of, uh, that's really one of the pillars of it. You know, speaking of that, that is uh, uh, my studies have done in the past two years, you know, we, by the way, in all this information, this uh, broadcast is gonna be in the crowdfund beat, which is, you know, we have about a year and a half, and all the information, the past interview, all the articles over there, the crowdfund beat, so we see a lot of trends happening, a lot of good things happening, and, but one thing I always share, you know, with a lot of you guys, in the, how are you gonna guard that? How are you gonna guard this industry from somebody to come out there and start something, you know, haywires, you know, and then we, after all this good publicity, we start getting some sort of kind of a negative news. I mean, uh, so are we gonna kind of guard this industry? How is, how is that gonna happen? Uh, you, you know, Jillian said it earlier, it's, this is a regulated industry and it's fantastic that it's regulated. I hope they bring more regulations, I mean, to some degree into the industry so that people don't get defrauded in the space and, uh, that they keep rules and regulations in play that keep companies legitimate, offers legitimate, the people that are running the companies legitimate. 
Um, and so as long as that continues to go on and, and, and they continue to put rules in place that allow companies like ours to be created but yet regulated so that no one can do anything bad to the investor, I think it's a great position to be in. I want to be more regulated as well. But Julian, you want to be more regulated? Yeah, I don't, I don't mind regulation. I mean, it's, it's a pain and it's expensive, but you know, it's, it's a cost of doing business. I, I think that you know, it's going to happen. There, there's going to be things that happen in the industry, and I think that it's, it's up to us, right, as the CEOs of companies like this, to do the right thing. It's, it's, it's shocking how hard it is sometimes to do the right thing, but I think if you do the right thing, you're transparent, um, you act swiftly and you act aggressively, you know, there's, there's always the opportunity to do the right thing. Now, the big challenge for platforms is going to be, do they have the capital to do the right thing? Um, you know, one of the reasons, again, we, we ran out and raised, you know, big VC money and, and gave away a chunk of the company is because we wanted to have the capital. Um, and, you know, at the end of the day, it's, it's believing in the CEOs, and not just the CEOs, but the leadership teams at crowdfunding platforms to do the right thing when, when things don't, don't happen the way that you expect them to. But you do, t you said that uh, I heard you turn away some tr uh, deals, not all the deals that they go through. So yeah, yeah we, we turn away the majority of transactions that we see. So yeah. what are they dissolved? They're just not fit to your platform? Yeah, I mean, you know, a lot of what we see is, is ground up development. Um, we don't invest in ground up development today. We're very focused on cash flow, the sort of you've got money concept that I talked about. Um, we see a lot of real estate sponsors who want to raise capital from the crowd that we don't think have the requisite track record to be raising capital from the crowd. Um, we don't want to, you know, be funding real estate entrepreneurs and real estate sponsors who haven't learned with their own capital. That's not to say that you know, we have a problem when a real estate entrepreneur is given a property back. You know, we, we like actually sometimes that they've learned that lesson on someone else's capital, but you know, we're, we're looking to work with well-established well real estate companies. Jonathan, regulation, good well, or bad? More. Good regulation is good and bad regulation <laughs> is bad. <laughs> <laughs> but not to be too flip about it, um, the, whole, the whole premise behind crowdfunding is, is changing the paradigm about how information flows to let more information flow rather than less information. What the flaw is in the 1933 Act, the Securities Act of 1933, is that it's an attempt to restrict information in the information age. Fundamentally, that doesn't work. It creates a conflict. Uh, I think everyone would welcome regulation that made crowdfunding platforms and crowdfunding players more transparent, more secure, and, and accountable to their investors. I think those are all things that work well. Things that try to constrict information mandate the flow of certain types of information, control the flow of information. I think those are all you know, fish trying to swim upstream and, and, and it's not going to work. Uh, I mean, you th think about uh, what are the things that government is good at? Well, government's good at you know, putting warheads on foreheads. Uh, is government good at controlling the flow of information? Well, we spent almost a billion dollars to build a website in healthcare.gov and it was not the most <laughs> successful uh, new website ever. That was the Canadian. I, I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I think government is government is, does does things well when they make rules that are clear, transparent, and understandable, uh, and they do less well when they try to constrict the flow of information. Yeah, well, thank. I should say that you know us in media and the conferences and other thing over there, we get a lot of PRs from every day. You know, somebody's out there in New Portal, but you know, I I know Julian, I know you, Brian, I know you, Carlo. I mean, you no. Know, we have to do our job to make sure that the people come in, you know, to the market that they they've been in legitimate. And you know, I know you guys been working so hard. That's what I'm very glad to be part of this thing, seeing you know grow. So we have to do our job to just not anybody comes over there trying to get them publicized, and be, we have to be careful with that over there. So, um, Michael, you have any question? Uh, I guess one question I'd have, uh, since this is a real estate panel and a crowdfunding event, is. Is what is the difference between a real estate crowdfunding and, and other types of platforms? I mean, are there some advantages or disadvantages? I mean, you've got, for instance, you've got a hard asset, right? I mean, that's what we liked about it when we, we unlike Carlo and Jillian, we're, we weren't real estate people when we stepped into this business. We become real estate people, uh, learning all the time. But we like the fact that there's a tangible asset, right, that people can relate to. And there, there aren't really good vehicles for investing in real estate. I mean, if you think about it, um, there are good vehicles for investing equity in companies, uh, more or less good, depending on your point of view. Um, there, there isn't that in real estate today. So I think it's different because um, I, I think that real estate investing can be difficult to access. I think it's, uh, it's a tangible asset. And I, I, I think it's, it's an inherently local market, right? We, I think it's, you can drive by what you own or what you're lending toward. And I think that's unique. 
I think um, to what Brian said, not only do I like real estate, I love real estate, <laughs> right? I mean, it's just a great asset. You know, my, back in the day when I was a kid, people used to say, listen, when you go buy real estate, you want to go walk up to the building every day, go, hello, building, how are you? And it's there, it's something you can see, it's something you can touch and use. And every single person in the world, or not many of the rich, richest people in the world are people that made their money in real estate. So by by allowing crowdfunding to, to take its piece of, of the real estate industry allows the general population that didn't have access to it before open up and, and make their investment into real estate. And again, to what Brian said, it's, it's expanding the reach. So previously, you know, a hundred years ago, people who had real estate was all local villages, little towns. It was you owned what you owned in, in your local neighborhood. Now a guy in California can own, own a piece of property in New York and soon international investors will be coming onto the platforms too. Guy in China will be participating in a deal in Texas and it's just a fantastic way for capital creation to be formed in America. Julian, the VCs love real estate. Obviously they love you. <laughs> or your they don't, company, they don't or your company both. Uh, it only takes one, right? As only say, one loves as you, as right? The other in, one. Uh, <laughs> in the VC world, the others are probably not so happy today. But um, for me, it's cash flow. I love cash flow, and you're not going to get cash flow investing in startups. And I, and I think that that's one of the reasons that real estate's going to be the biggest asset class in crowdfunding. Well, let's take, you have any other questions? You, if anybody have any questions, we're going to wrap it up. Go ahead. Uh, this is a short Ground floor has the same uh, prerogative that a bank would have uh, in first position. So we can move to foreclose on the property, and we can take it and liquidate it and return the uh, return the what's left to investors. Have you had to do that? I don't want to become too good at that. Uh, <laughs> and, and no, I haven't had to do it. Uh, that's not to say that we won't have to. At some point, we're we are absolutely prepared to. Uh, we know how to do it. Fortunately, in our asset class, it's it's well understood how to do it. Uh, fortunately or unfortunately, if you've been the subject of a foreclosure, it's quite unfortunate. Uh, and different states have different laws about it, uh, of which we're aware. So I think there are, um, the important thing for us is to maximize recovery for our investors. Uh, and that's what we do. Just a wrap up question, anybody? 2000, next year, 2015, where is the real estate going to be with the cloud funding? Quick. Just a it's going to be even more firmly established than it is today, and, uh, and firms like the ones represented here today are going to be uh, very busy getting deals done. Julian, what do you see? Well over a billion dollars in transactions. Wow. Wow. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> there are going to be a lot of platforms uh, doing a lot of work in a lot of different subsegments of this market. It's just going to be an exciting. I think the next 18 months particularly are going to be very exciting. Paulo? Uh, I've been at a few crowdfunding conferences with these two folk at the table here, and um, so people are saying there's going to be 100 to 200 different crowdfunding platforms out there just for real estate, and uh, that's quite shocking to know that that many people are coming into the space. Um, so Jillian's $1 billion number, yeah, hopefully it is. Yeah. It's great it's good for, for everybody. everybody. Michael, uh, you think uh, it's, there is a marriage between the real estate the world and the crowdfunding? Yeah, I think it's going to grow substantially. I mean, you think about a small investor getting to use the experience and the know-how and the reach of a large sponsor uh, that knows what they're doing with property. So if I'm a small investor, I can use that experience and have that work for me. Having said that, I had a question from a listener last week, uh, which property type that I thought was going to escalate in value the most over the next two or three years. And you know, I preface that answer with it really depends on the market, the city, the submarket, the actual asset, and I think most importantly, the sponsor and how good they are at managing that aspect and asset that property and an asset managing it. Um, and the answer to the question it was uh, my answer is industrial. Uh, I think industrial is going to to grow in value because of all the, all the online sales and that sort of thing. So we see the millionaire next door is going to come jump into this market. Yeah, I think they are, and I think it's going to open up a lot of other uh, other business 
uh, around it as well. Uh, I think it's going to grow a lot of businesses like like someone was telling us, you know, our radio show has become m much more popular because people are going to be looking for areas where they can understand more about real estate and they can go read blogs and articles and videos and understand, you know, market updates and what's going on in the sector, what vacancies and, and, and things are doing around the country. Okay. Well, Jillian, Jonathan, Brian, Carlo, Michael, anybody else? One more question? Go ahead. Just we take one more question then. Yeah, okay. go ahead. I brought that up, this, this idea of counterparty risk on, on the platforms or other lenders or other you know, sponsors that we're doing business with. I, I don't see the returns being any different um, because they can't be, right? In, unless you're, you're charging an underlying return that is more expensive to an underlying borrower or to a sponsor, you know, that means it's a riskier deal, just the deal itself. Um, so I wouldn't say that the, that the returns are any different for that, but I think it's something that investors really need to watch out for. You know, there are some platforms where you know, that, return, that risk is lower than other platforms. Well, I should say thank you very much. I know you guys are busy and the deal is flowing and so it's just wonderful news and all. We appreciate you giving us your time to people at home with the crowdfund beat and uh, this crowdfunding USA, which is great. We share all of your knowledge. Hopefully we see a lot of great things happening. We go in that wow moment. And uh, for audience at home, this is Sydney Armani with crowdfund beat in the Silicon Valley and here in the great state of Georgia, and we were that had with the crowdfunding USA saying so long. Thank you very much. I'm interested in hearing about your regulatory. Yeah, I'm it's novel. Too. We're going to take about um, 10 minutes break, then we're going to have an equity crowdfunding panel.